<laughs> so thank you, Susan, for giving us the opportunity to have an experience of those beautiful prayers in the Sikh community. And many of you know that Susan studied Sikhism for a number of years. And so what a joy, what a joy to hear that from your, your words, your voice. So we are in the midst of our fall program, second week of uh, Valerie Carr's book, See No Stranger. And as I mentioned last week, we're taking a look at these ideas in See No Stranger with three different uh, legs of a stool, if you could. So we've got the other, the opponent, and ourselves. And we are looking at what does it mean to be in revolutionary love for each of those areas, knowing that we can only be in revolutionary love in community. It is not something that I can just do for me. It is not something I can just do for you or for my opponent, but I'm, it must include all. And so we are on our second week of the other. And of course, the practice that comes when we see no, no other is the practice of see no stranger, which was our practice for last week. That idea that you are a part of me I do not yet know. And this week we move into, um, so last week we were looking at eyes and wonder. This week it's a little bit more heavy. I'm just warning you ahead of time because what we're looking at is grief and fight. And those, those are challenging concepts, especially in unity where we are coming together to learn positive, practical transformation. And so sometimes some of these ideas in grief and fight may be difficult for us to hear, but they're so important to the concept of revolutionary love that Valerie invites us into. So I'm really aware that as, as, as a culture, as a society, that we push aside grief. It's not something that we feel comfortable with. So if somebody in our life is grieving, they make us uncomfortable in their grief and we want them to move through it quickly. Grief is the price of love, Valerie tells us. And she also tells us that grieving is an act of surrender. You must keep the borders of your heart porous in order to love well. And so there's a, a beautiful practice to allowing ourselves and one another to grieve and to not push ourselves too quickly through the grief because when we do that, we miss an opportunity, that opportunity to be together in revolutionary love. So Valerie brings up how we in grief and move through grief um, with these ideas of the other. She shares some stories within this book of, of videos that she created after 9-11. You see, this country, our country, perhaps humankind, let me take a step back. I was having lunch with a dear, dear friend on Friday, and we were talking about many of these ideas, and the question that came to us, is this just human nature? This idea to other one another, to separate, to divide, is that just a part of human nature? And it appears that throughout history, this is what we have done. We have othered one another. Even within our own country, our beloved country, we have othered one another. We have this beautiful idea that all men are created equal with the, with the ability to pursue happiness. And yet, since its beginnings, we as a country have struggled to truly live into that vision. And isn't that the way life works? We get this grand and glorious vision of, of oneness, of loving one another, of you are my brother and you are my sister. And we have this vision intellectually in mind, and then we get to live into that idea. And this is what our country has been doing since it began. It began with that big glorious vision. All men are created equal. And then since that time, we have one step at a time by fighting for one another and grieving with one another. We have evolved this country forward so that it becomes more and more inclusive of that idea. An idea that at its beginning only, only incorporated white men and then eventually black men, and then eventually women, and then eventually our indigenous brothers and sisters. And all along the way, we have been fighting for that equality for one another. And so it's not surprising that on 9-11, we as a country got to experience again that othering of one another. 
Because I think when we don't allow ourselves the time to grieve, to really feel the feelings, to be in the sadness, the grief of what is, asking ourselves, what if I, am I here to learn from this? What is this here to show me, to teach me? How is this opening my heart more deeply to loving? Instead, what we do is turn to blame. That pain and that suffering and that sorrow that we're feeling turns to the blaming of the other. And so Valerie tells stories within this chapter on grieving to move us into understanding how easy it is for us to other one another when we push aside the grief because it's uncomfortable to sit within those feelings. She tells the story of Amrik Singh Kala, who was the very first person, perhaps the very first Sikh, um, certainly the very first Sikh, but perhaps the very first person after the fall of those twin towers to be othered. Because he was there when the towers fell, and like so many, he was rushing to get out of the area. And he was a sick man in a turban. And in moments after those towers fell, people looked at him and blamed him and othered him and said, you're a terrorist, go home. As he was himself trying to move away from the destruction that was happening around him. She tells the story of Navinder Deep Nihir, who was a doctor and so as a doctor, when everybody else was moving out of New York City, he was rushing into New York City to say, what can I do? What can I do to help? And of course, as we all know, there were not a lot of survivors to help. But what he spent three days doing was giving medical attention to those emergency workers who came in. Three exhausting days before he finally took a break. And as he left New York City and returned to go home again with that turban, people began pointing to him and calling him a terrorist and telling him, go home. She tells the story of Sher Singh, another turbaned Sikh man, who on September 12th was taking the train home. And already at the train station, people were pointing to him, pointing to his turban, whispering among each other. And as the train started on its journey, suddenly it stopped, and they were told there's something wrong with the tracks, but outside could be seen groups of people coming. And the officials boarded that train. Guns aimed at Sher Singh arresting him as a terrorist. And that was what we saw on our nightly news that night. The first terrorist was arrested because Sher Singh had a turban and brown skin and was othered in that moment out of fear. She tells the story of Aftar Singh, an elderly Sikh man who on 9-11 uh, hurt heart, sitting with this grief, went to his gurdwara to hold in prayer each one who had been injured, each one who had been killed, singing those beautiful chants like Susan just shared with us, praying for those who had died. And on his way home from that Gurdwara was also attacked, called a terrorist, told, go home. And finally, the one most close to Valerie's heart herself was Balbir Uncle. Balbir Uncle, who had come to the United States uh, escaping um, oppression in India, well-loved by his community. He would go with candy to the children and, and pass out candy. If people came into his little store, into his little gas station, and didn't have the money, it was okay. Come back and pay me when you can. And he had bought these crates of flowers that he was going to plant with U.S. flags to say, we are one, we stand with one another. And as he was there by his flowers, getting ready for them to be planted, a gunman came by in a car and shot and killed him. Terrorist, go home. 
Valerie mentions within this book that this is story after story after story that the Sikh community experienced following in the days following 9-11. Stories I didn't hear of, stories that they heard of because they were the Sikh community. But they are stories that remind me of what happens when we don't allow ourselves the time to sit within the grief of what's happening and instead move to blame and to othering. And so I recognize how challenging it can be to sit with the grief, to sit with the sadness, to sit with the lesson that it has to offer us. I think all of us have experienced this in the past six months since the coronavirus has swept the world and we're all needing to take a step back from the activity that we are so used to. We, we speak of wanting to return to normal. We want to get back and be with one another and be in parties and celebrate weddings and funerals together and there's a grief that's present with those feelings. Can you feel it? And what we want to do is escape that grief to say, let us just go back to normal. And I'm concerned that in the process, what we are missing out of is this great gift of an opportunity just like 9-11 provided for us to sit with the sadness and say, what's being uncovered here? What's here for me to look at? What's here for me to see differently? What's here for me to learn from this experience? Because as community, we can sit with our grief and ask those questions and be inspired into different actions, healing that which is causing, underlying this grief, right? So here in this this time, as as we see what, what has arisen, our fragility of our economic system, how easily it can be impacted and destroyed by something very simple that affects the whole world. You know, the fragility of our education system where there, are, there is not equality for our children. There are some school districts, they're getting through this fine. Their students have the resources to meet online and continue their education. And then we have others in their communities that don't. And so there's this inequality that happens within our education system and inequality within our health care system. All the number of people in our country that are without health care, finding their way through this time. Inequality of the ways in which we are together. And then our own loneliness, our own fears, our own concerns that are added into this. And in this level of anxiety, we all want to go, I just want this to be over. I just want to go back to normal. As do I, friends. As do I. But this is where we are. Can we sit with our grief together in community, hearts open, and ask, what is there for us to learn here? Is there there something that we can find underneath of this grief that is worth fighting for? In the Sikh tradition, the idea of warrior sage is there. I read the story. Susan actually encouraged me to read the story story of Guru Gobind Singh, who was the tenth and final guru. And as I read about his story, I, I read this tale that before he was born, the divine said to him, I need you to go and be a warrior for justice for the oppressed, for the victims. And his response was, well, let me be born and go sit on a mountaintop to meditate on that. And isn't that what we want to do? Let me just just go to prayer for you. Let me just sit here in meditation for you. Let me just hold in my mind my oneness that I have with you. So it's not surprising that he had the same response. But God, the divine, Waheguru, said to him, No, what I need is someone who is willing to do the work that is needed in order to bring about justice, to be this warrior sage. And Guru Gobind Singh, as all Sikhs, said, Yes, I will follow your will, God. And so he was born. This is the late 1600s when the the Mughals are coming through into northern India. 
with their forced conversion of Christians and Hindus and Sikhs to Muslim, to, to Islam. And as those warriors are coming through, Guru Gobind Singh as a young boy, his father dead, steps into the role of warrior sage for his Sikh community. There's an interesting story in there where he needs to empower the people. They need to know what they have within them. And so he gathers the people and there's a tent behind him and he comes out in this booming voice and says, I need someone who will give me their head for justice. And nobody's responding. I'm not giving up my head. <laughs> But finally, one man does, and he comes forward, and, and Guru Gobind Singh invites him into the tent, and the people outside can hear what sounds like a head being lopped off. And Guru Gobind Singh comes back out with a bloodied knife, and he says it again, who will give me their head for justice? And this happens five times, and surprisingly, five people say yes. And with the fifth one, Guru Gobind Singh comes out of that tent with those five ones following him. And he now has five, five Sikhs with a pure heart and a deep faith that he knows are ready to fight for justice. And with that, all of the people are empowered. Guru Gobind Singh goes on to fight the oppressor, but he has with him the um, tenants of warrior sage in Sikhism. We are here to fight for justice, to fight for those who are oppressing, to fight for those who, for whom injustice is, you know, their life. But we may not fight as an act of aggression, only as an act of defense, and only as a last resort. He goes on in fighting to lose all four of his sons, ages 7 to 17. He gives all, and eventually he himself is killed. But what Guru Gobind Singh decides and says to the Sikh people is you no longer need a living guru. You have it all within the words of those beautiful sacred scriptures Thank you, Siddhi Guru Granth Sad Sadi. Yeah, is that it? Okay. Thank you, Susan. I'm glad Susan's here with me today. And he says, you have that, those words, and the wisdom within your heart, and a community, and now you all have what you need to be the warrior sage. And so these ideas of fighting for injustice, fighting for those ones who have been oppressed is a part of the Sikh tradition. And Valerie invites us into four questions at the end of this chapter on fighting. What can I use to fight with? What is my sword? You'll recall a couple of weeks ago I shared with you that in the Sikh tradition they carry a sword of some sort with them. Maybe on a chain or maybe a small sword they carry in their pocket, but it's the reminder it's their reminder that they are warriors for justice. So what is your sword? What is my sword? You know, I'm pretty clear that my sword is my words. It's the way in which I use my words here in spiritual community, on my social media accounts, with my family and with my friends. The words that I use to speak up about justice and sometimes my voice shakes. Sometimes I think this might not go over well. There are going to be people that disagree with me. And I'm sure throughout history, those ones who have stood up for justice have felt those same things. But we must use our sword, whatever that is. What is your sword? Perhaps it's your willingness to write to your Congress people to ask them to make changes. Perhaps your sword is reaching out to people in your community that you do not know and reaching out to them and saying hello and introducing yourself and getting to know their story. 
Whatever your sword is, find it. Second, what is your shield? What is your shield? For Valerie, for myself, it is those others who join with us in community and say, I will join you as an ally. I am an ally that speaks up for injustices toward our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, for those ones who are experiencing racial injustice. All of those who join me in that, to learn, to understand, to grow, we are together the shield for one another. What is your shield? What is your instrument, she asks us. Now here's what can happen. We can get to that place of fight and we can react from that place of fight and we can do a lot of destruction. But part of the Sikh tradition is to first center yourselves. Remember that ich und kar, that oneness of God, that oneness with one another. What centers you before you go out with your sword and your shield to do the work? A morning prayer call for me. My time of meditation. I have a, a beautiful singing bowl that I put on my chest and, and, and hit it and listen to that vibration that goes through me that reminds me and recenters me again because we cannot do ours to do unless we center ourselves within that spirit of God within. And then finally, the fourth question is, who is your sacred community? Who is your sacred community? We have fall program groups going on right now, about a dozen of them, people coming together in sacred community to talk about these ideas. That is a sacred community. Your friends, your neighbors, your family, who is your sacred community that you are joining together with? to be that place of grieving the injustice first, bearing witness to it, seeing, acknowledging it, and then fighting for justice. And as Valerie is committed to, as I am committed to, doing so in such a way that it is nonviolent fighting. How can we together, join together, seeing the truth together, being willing together, to draw close to one another, to realize and to recognize that we are not alone. I wanted to share with you a quote that I found on truth unity from Eric Butterworth that I thought really spoke to this this morning. Eric tells us, and this is from uh, Unity Podcast number 51, The Courage to Be You. Because, because a warrior sage requires courage. That's why strength is our power today. Strength, that strength of God within, is what gives us the courage to do what is ours to do, to persevere. So this is the podcast that this is coming from. And Eric tells us, we're coming to know that we're living as members of a global society in one great village and we are all a part of it. We have a responsibility to each other. Freedom to do what we want is gone. We have to be a part of the whole, a society, a relationship. This book is inviting you and I to be in relationship with those that we would consider others, to see them with new eyes, to keep our hearts open and our eyes in wonder. So that when we look out, we see a reflection of ourselves. In um, the Sikh tradition, Valerie calls those uh, men and women in her life auntie and uncle. They see one another as family. And so the, the verse that came to me around the hat within my song was, Auntie, uncle, niece, or nephew, there's my reflection when I see you. Are we willing to not only see one another as a part of ourselves, but also to allow ourselves to grieve with one another and then to fight for justice together? So we will be practicing 
Now, I want to share with you that if we were here in Unity Hall, you would all be filling out your um, intention cards, and I invited you last week to send me a picture of your intention for the week, and I want to thank Brian Lowry. Thank you, Brian. He sent me his intention. I'm going to remember that you are a part of me I do not yet know. Yes, I know Brian isn't the only one holding an intention last week. And if we were together, we would be putting those intentions perhaps on our web. And on that web, we'd see our intentions growing each week. And so what I'm inviting you to is to support me in seeing our intentions growing over this next month. And so while we start with Brian's intention, your intentions can be added on to that. And so as you set your intention this week for how you will practice this week, I'm inviting you again. Take a picture. If you have the bookmark, and there are still lots of bookmarks outside of Unity Hall, by the way. Thank you, Sandra Legal, for creating these. We have intention cards right on the bookmark. So we have a green one for today, for the power of strength. What is your intention? Here's the practice. As you move through the activity of each day, hold the question, Who do I need to pay attention to in this moment? This may be a child, a partner, a friend, a coworker, an organization. Listen, as I'm sharing this series, don't think that this needs to be great, grand, glorious things that you've suddenly got to go move out into. No, begin where you are, in your home, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your school, whatever it may be, start there. Who do I need to pay attention to in this moment? And when the who becomes clear, ask them, what do you need? How can I support you? Do you need a listening ear? Offer them a smile, whatever it may be. Be ready to support them in their response. You are brave. You are courageous. You have that spirit of God within you to be able to do the work that is yours to do. And with that, I'm going to end with our scripture that is coming from the Sikh Guru Granth Sahib, page four. Countless devotees contemplate the wisdom and virtues of the Lord. Countless the holy, countless the givers, countless heroic spiritual warriors who bear the brunt of the attack in battle. Countless silent sages vibrating the string of his love. Thank you for joining me this week to be one of the countless warrior sages sages, vibrating the string of the love of the divine.